So John starts this section off with, with after this. After this. And so anytime you see something like therefore or after this, you have to ask, what's it after? What, what is he referring to? This is after the resurrection. This is after the appearance to Mary Magdalene. After the appearance to the disciples. And then the disciples again, but this time with Thomas. This is after all that, that we spent leading up to the crucifixion. Like th- the disciples have been through a whole lot after this. John doesn't tell us how much longer after this, but he just says after. He's not, he's not too concerned about the time, but he, he wants us to understand the chronology. After this, Jesus revealed himself to the disciples. We'll get back to that word revealed, because it's important. But let's see the setting. They're at the Sea of Tiberias, also known as the Sea of Galilee. This is where Jesus really started his ministry. His first miracle was in Cana of Galilee, in this area. They're in the sea, they're, they're in Galilee, they're at the Sea of Galilee, because Jesus had told them, go to Galilee and wait for me. We, we don't see this in John, because John doesn't tell us this, but we see it in Matthew and we see it in Mark. Jesus says, go to Galilee and wait for me. I will meet you there. So they're in Galilee and they're waiting. And so we have this group of disciples sitting around. I, I, I don't know what they were doing, but they're sitting around doing nothing. Right? You, have, you have Peter, you have Thomas, you have the, the sons of Zebedee who are James and John. Remember, John never refers to himself by his name. And he typically does not refer to his family members by their names. His, he really wants the focus to not be on him. So he just says, the sons of Zebedee. So we have, we have Peter and Thomas and James and John and, Bar- and Nathaniel. This is the first time that Nathaniel's mentioned by name since chapter 1. And two unnamed disciples. You know, I find it fascinating that if you read the commentaries around this The amount of effort that is given to trying to figure out who the other two disciples were. Isn't that just like us? We want to know the things that we're not told. We want to sit down and feel, well, who were the other two? It could have been Andrew because he's Peter's brother. And Philip because Philip's the one who brought Nathaniel along. And they could have been, and there's all this ink that is just really wasted on who these other two could be. Here's what we know. They're two disciples and they're not named. That's what we know. And so as they're waiting, you have this group of guys waiting, and they're just waiting for Jesus. And so Peter says, I'm going fishing. And the others say, good idea, let's go. So they decide to go fishing. And there's a lot of debate on the theological implications of Peter's fishing. Why was he fishing? Did he abandon Jesus' call to him? Did he, did he, should he have been preaching? Should he have been doing the work of the ministry? Why is Peter fishing? Well, I think we really can look too much into the minutia and actually lose sight of what's happening. Here's Peter. Peter's sitting around. He's waiting for Jesus. Remember, Peter does not yet have the Holy Spirit. uh, Jesus has not given them the Great Commission. Jesus just said, go to Galilee and wait for me, and I'll tell you what to do. So they're waiting. They're waiting. A lot of these debates on whether or not Peter was being disobedient are really unfair. Peter and a number of the other disciples, including James and John, who were here with them, were fishermen before they met Jesus. This was their career. And we know that Peter, if not the others, were married. Peter had a wife. He had somebody to take care of. Remember, at the cross, John was given the responsibility of taking care of Mary. So they had people to feed. They had people to take care of. What were they to do? They went to work. And as with most fishermen, I imagine it was relaxing for them. It was a way to to move on with their lives, to, to sit and figure things out while at the same time earning a living. They had to eat. 
They had to provide for those in their care. And so they went fishing. Remember, they, they were waiting for Jesus. They were waiting for the Holy Spirit. They were in the midst of waiting. So they did what they knew. And so the disciples are out fishing. And they're out fishing all night. And if you have ever gone fishing, there is nothing more aggravating than fishing and catching nothing. It's really boring, especially when your career and your income is based on how much fish you catch. And so you have these disciples, they're out, and they catch nothing. What they wanted to to have this productive time was not productive. And it's interesting that that John points out in in chapter 4, as the day was breaking, the disciples are out fishing all night. Night is darkness. Remember what John often does with darkness and light. He uses the physical darkness and physical light as a spiritual representation They're in darkness. They don't know what's next. They don't know what they're doing. It's unproductive. And then, when the day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. This is the setting in which John wrote that Jesus revealed himself again. The sun is coming up. They haven't caught anything all night, and a man appears on the shore. And at first, they don't recognize him. Again, we aren't told the reason why they don't recognize him. The, the two on the road to Emmaus didn't recognize him because their, their eyes were covered. They, they, they were prevented from seeing who it actually was. This, it could be that they, Jesus was on shore and they were in the boat and, and the light was coming up and there's, there's mist, there's fog, and they can't see clear. We don't know why they couldn't see that it was Jesus, but all we know is they didn't know it was him. And so this man appears on the shore, and he calls out to them, children, children. Isn't that a weird word in English to give to seven grown men? Children? If it's in our culture, that would be highly offensive. You're acting like a bunch of kids. No, children, it's a term of endearment. It's compassion. It's... John, in his epistles later when he writes, he he uses this word for adults, children. Jesus loves them and he cares for them. It's a term of endearment. It's also a way of just saying, hey guys, we don't know exactly what Jesus, how he intended it, but it is a term of endearment that stuck with John because he used it later on in his letters. Children, do you have any fish? Again, in English, we miss the implications of Jesus' question. They don't remember. Remember, they don't know it's Jesus. But this isn't a simple, do you, do you have any fish? This is, you haven't caught anything, have you? He knows. Children, you haven't caught anything, have you? You've been fishing all night and you haven't caught a thing, have you? And I love their answer. No. This is like, what did you learn today at school? Nothing. It's the same sort of thing. What'd you ca- have you caught anything? No. They're not, they're not a, a group of men of many words. Short and to the point, I think it shows their frustration. And so then again, Jesus, his identity is still hidden, says to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Now, now think about this. First, it should have triggered a memory. Because the disciples have already been with Jesus once, where they fished all night. Jesus said, go back out there, throw your nets on the other side, and you'll catch some. And they caught so many fish, it took two boats to bring them in. So it should have triggered something. But they don't know it's Jesus. Throw your net on the right side of the boat. They had been fishing all night. They were professionals. They knew how to fish. There was nothing, their boat wasn't very big. This stage is bigger than their boat was. It's not like over here there's no fish, 
But over here, this is the side. It's not that at all. Like, there's no magic in the water. There's no line or wall that goes underneath the boat and divides the water that the fish can't swim over to the other side. There is no logical reason why casting the net on the other side of the boat would work. Nothing. There's no logical reason. Nevertheless, they listened. Now think about what got them to the point of being able to listen. What got them to the point of listening to a man who's on the shore who says something ridiculous? Throw your nuts on the other side and you'll catch some fish. What brought them to this point? They had seen Jesus do amazing things. They had seen nature bend in ways that you and I cannot fathom. They have seen God do incredible things. They saw the feeding of the 5,000. They saw Jesus walking on water. They watched as Jesus spoke to the storm and it stopped. And they saw the resurrected Jesus. Like these men knew that God was capable of doing more thing, things more magnificent than filling a net full of fish. Now, they didn't know it was Jesus on the shore, but they knew what God was capable of. They had experienced incredible things, and they knew that nothing was impossible. And so they listened. They throw their net off the right side of the boat, and they caught so many fish they were not able to haul it in. John immediately understands it's Jesus. And I love how this plays out. Because John is always, or often, the first to understand. And Peter is the first to act. And this, I resonate with this so much. Because I am one who is more about action before understanding. I will jump in before I understand the full implications of what is going on. And I am so grateful when, when we look at the, the pro proposed, the prospective elders, they are a group of men, many of whom think and try to figure things out and they want to understand before they act. And it takes both, right? We have, in one case, we can have paralysis by analysis. and the other, we just have, at times, chaos. Like, we'll just keep jumping in. And so we see, even in the disciples, how God sovereignly chose people to lead his church who are, who are built and who function so differently. I joke with Wes because... When I build something, yeah, I take 35 trips to Home Depot because I don't plan it out. I know what I want, and so I'll just keep going. Like, I'll just go and get more. If I run out of screws, I'll go buy more screws. If I need more wood, I'll just go buy more wood. Wes has a spreadsheet with the amount of screws that he needs. Like, we are so different, and I love how God brings his body together and says, you are different, and I want you both in the church. This is Peter and John. John says it's Jesus. And Peter, he, he puts on his, his outer garment. I mean, he's not fishing in his full robe and his outer robe, and, you know, when you fish, you don't want to be fully dressed. So the, the word is actually wrap it around. The last time that we saw this word is when Jesus wrapped a towel around his waist. So, so Peter wraps his outer garment around him. Why he grabbed his outer garment, I don't know, but he jumps in the water. Think about Peter. Right? In, in this case, he's the first to act. But he, he had seen the resurrected Jesus, but he had not had a conversation with his Lord about what he did. Peter had not had a conversation with Jesus, and I know, I know because I understand human nature that this was always on Peter's mind. He denied Jesus three times. And yet, 
He, he saw Jesus. He did not have a conversation with him yet. We could easily justify Peter sitting in the back of the boat. Instead of being the first one off the boat, he could have easily been the last one off the boat. And we would sit here and we would say, yeah, Peter, I get it. I wouldn't want to get off the boat either after what you did. He could have stayed in the background and sulked and and felt self-pity. But no, Peter ran to the tomb. Peter jumps out of the boat and he swims to Jesus because he didn't want to wait for the boat to get there. I mean, think about this in your life. How many times have you said to yourself, this sin has seemed like it's mastered me, I'm done. I'm not doing that again. And then tomorrow comes, and you do the same thing. And you say, all right, this time I'm not doing that again. And you, and then tomorrow comes, and you do the same thing. We give in to sin, and oftentimes we run from Jesus. We feel unworthy. We feel self-pity. We feel shame. And instead of running to Jesus, we run away from Jesus or his body. And we, we mess up and we say, well, I'm not going to join the church family this week because I don't feel worthy or they wouldn't accept me if they knew who I was or what I did. Or you can fill in the blank because you've had that feeling. Peter jumps in the water. Peter knew that Jesus was the only one who could remove his sin and his shame. Peter knew that Jesus' love and compassion was greater than any sin he had ever committed. Peter knew that Jesus was the one who loved him and cared for him and accepted him for who he was. Brothers and sisters, let us be a church who points people to Jesus, the one who knows our sin, who loves us and forgives us and calls us to him. This is why we say the welcome every Sunday morning. Because we are that person to all who are weary and need rest. Well, if that doesn't describe you, I don't know if you're looking in the mirror or if you're being honest with yourself. To all who mourn and need comfort. To all who feel worthless and wonder if God cares. How many times have you given into sin and said, I don't think God loves me anymore. I don't think I'm worthy. To all who fail and desire strength. To all who sin and need a Savior. This is why we say that every week. Because it's me It's you. It's all of us. We are that person. And let us be the church that opens wide her doors with a welcome from Jesus Christ, the ally of his enemies, the justifier of the inexcusable, the friend of sinners. Peter ran, and Peter swam to Jesus. Instead of running away, he knew the only one who would ever be there for him who would ever forgive him, who would ever satisfy the desire that he had to be loved by God, to be forgiven. So the boat gets to, gets to the land and there's a charcoal fire cooking on it. This is no accident. There's a charcoal fire. Remember the last time there was a charcoal fire? It's when Peter was denying Jesus in the courtyard of the high priest Jesus specifically is cooking over a charcoal fire. And I would almost guarantee you that it triggered something in Peter. He remembered what he had done. So he's cooking over a charcoal fire. He's cooking breakfast for the disciples. So Jesus tells them, hey, bring some of the fish that you caught. So Peter, and I love this. Peter, 
runs, he jumps on the boat, he grabs the net, my, my assumption is it's tied somewhere on the boat because they couldn't drag it in. He, he gets into the boat, he grabs the net, and he single-handedly runs at the shore. Peter had to have been ripped. The net wasn't, but he was. Because there's 153 large fish in this net. Peter jumps onto the boat, and he grabs it, and he drags it onto the shore single-handedly. Now, what is the significance of 153 fish? There was 153 fish. That's the significance. Why does John give that number? Because he counted them. I'm telling you, like, you can get so lost into theories and things. These were fishermen. This was their career. They needed to sell these fish and make some money. They counted them. You better believe they counted them. And they're fishermen. I mean, if it's like modern-day fishermen, they probably had 140, but they had to exaggerate a little bit, so they said 153. No, they had 153 fish because they counted them. Now, it's easy to go through this section without seeing some of the implications of what's happening a little beneath the surface. The resurrected Jesus is still serving his disciples. Allow that to sink in for a moment. Jesus served his disciples. He washed their feet. He took care of them. He taught them. He was crucified. He resurrected. Here's the resurrected Jesus, and he is taking care of his disciples, their physical needs. He is still serving them. He knows their needs, and he's concerned enough to take care of them. They had been fishing all night. They caught nothing. They were hungry. They were probably hangry. Because they hadn't caught anything, they had nothing to be happy about until Jesus comes on the scene. But they're hungry, and so he is cooking them breakfast. Imagine getting off the boat, going to shore, and you see Jesus there, the resurrected Jesus in his resurrected body cooking you breakfast. Lest you think that leadership means lording it over somebody... Or simply giving directions Jesus shows otherwise. Leadership is about serving. See, this is the major problem in our culture. We think that leadership does not involve service or that serving is somehow demeaning. Husbands, part of the way that you lead your house and your family is by serving. Parents, part of the way that you lead your kids is by serving. Kids, do not point that out to your parents. Do not tell your parents you're not serving me enough. But it is the way that we serve and love and lead is by serving. Jesus is our example in this. We know this. We do this. If you are a, if you have a job where others report to you, are you known as a boss who makes demands, or is you, are you known as a boss who serves alongside? Jesus is our example. You are, never, you are never below serving somebody. You are never below caring for somebody. Jesus served his disciples after he was resurrected. The resurrected Jesus, who would soon ascend to heaven and sit at the Father's right hand, is making them breakfast. Come and have breakfast, he says to them. But, but none of the disciples dared to ask Jesus, who are you? I like that John wrote, none of them dared to ask Jesus. They all wanted to. But they all knew who it was. It's like, are, are, is that Jesus? Like, that's Jesus. But, but Jesus was, was crucified. Jesus was resurrected. Imagine their, their thoughts. Imagine the, the brain twisting that was happening in this moment. They're bewildered. They're confused. They're in wonder. They knew that it was Jesus, yet they had seen him crucified. They, they had seen him resurrected. They, 
there's so much that's going through their minds. I, I can't imagine that this was easy to process. The whole scenario seems strange to them. Imagine getting out of the boat and seeing Jesus cooking breakfast. It, but they knew what they were experiencing. It's kind of like that, well, I, I know what I'm experiencing, but this doesn't make sense. And so they're processing it. Last week we talked about those moments in our lives that become monuments to us. Those, those moments, the, the Old Testament, they call them Ebenezer's, the, the, the monuments that Israel was told to build or those things that we, we, re, we remember, whether it's our baptism or the family dedication. Moments that we look back and remember God's provision, his love, his care, and his compassion. Moments that we, we see the times that he took care of us and provided for us. It's these moments that enable us to move forward and to continue to trust him when times are hard, when we don't know the outcome, when things don't seem to go as planned. One of the things that I am so grateful for is that in the 22 years that Melissa and I have been married, we have seen this over and over again, where God provided for us in ways that we could not have expected or fathom. Just out of the blue, God took care of our needs in ways that we did not expect. You ever have a need and you sit there and you, you think, all right, well, how is this going to work? Like, how is this? What, one of our kids refused to nurse. We could not afford formula. This was Jenna. We could not afford formula. And we had no idea. We had no idea how God was going to provide for us. Because formula is expensive. And so we said either, either God has to make Jenna change or he has to give us formula. Like one of those two, those two things has to happen. The next day, I get a phone call. Uh, a, a son of a friend worked at Pfizer. He didn't know us, but he said, hey, I, I get Infamil, no, Similac. I get Similac for free, and I would like to have it delivered to your house once a week. Is that okay? So imagine that that is one of our moments. That is one of our Ebenezer's that we look at and say, you could have asked me, and in a thousand years, I would not have written that scenario down as the way that God would have provided. I lost my job when I was a prosecutor, when I was a judicial attorney and magistrate because of politics, and, but I lost my job. Our kids were going to a Christian school. Tuition was due. Melissa had sat that day and said, all right, I'm going to go to the principal and I'm going to say, can, you, um, can, can we delay payment? So she gets to the school, and the principal runs out to find her and says, somebody stopped by and paid the tuition for the rest of the year. All right. M moments. These are Ebenezer's in our life where when, when we need a crazy moment, we can say, God has done amazing things in our lives. Three weeks before Jenna is supposed to go to college, she says, I'm, I want to go to Grace. Okay, that was not on the plan. Grace, I don't know if you know this, Grace College, Christian colleges are not cheap. But she had good scholarships and financial aid was there, and, but we needed to come up with $11,000 in three weeks. That is not something that we have the capability of doing. Somebody said to me, we want to pay for Jenna's tuition. Ebenezer's, moments where we can look and say, God is so faithful in ways that we never, ever can comprehend. This moment for these disciples was that moment. When they get on, they're out fishing all night, they catch nothing. And Jesus knows their need, and he says, throw your nets in the other side, and I'll give you 153 large fish. They pulled ashore. They are able to then sell the fish. That's what, 
John doesn't tell us that's what happened, but that's what happened. They're fishermen for a living. And he's cooking them breakfast. He provides for them. Imagine those times where they're hungry later in their ministry. Imagine their times where they don't know what's going to happen. Peter's wife, he's got to take care of her. John, his mom, and presumably he's married, and he's taking care of Mary as well. How are we going to do this? Well, we've seen Jesus do amazing things. We know that. And we've seen the resurrected Jesus do amazing things. This is the Ebenezer. This is why we have them. This is why James says, consider it pure joy when you encounter various trials because you know the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Why does it develop perseverance? Because you know what God is capable of and you know what God is faithful in doing. You get to see God provide. It's a completely different thing when you experience him providing than when you simply read about him providing. Do you have those moments in your life where God has taken care of you in ways that you did not see happening and you cannot fathom how it even happened. The disciples had this right in this moment. This was an Ebenezer for them. And so this, John tells us, this, this was the third time that Jesus revealed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. This wasn't the third time that Jesus appeared. He appeared to Mary Magdalene in the book of John. So there's four, but this was the third time to the disciples. And he uses the word revealed. And that word is significant. Because the action is on Jesus. is on his self-disclosure. He is revealing himself to them. This is not on their actions. This is not on their understanding. They, They don't understand what's going on yet. So Jesus reveals himself to them. We know that faith is a journey. The the going from, from no faith to saving faith is rarely one step. It it can be God is capable of doing anything. It can be one simple step, but often it's a journey. And we see God move and He Jesus revealed Himself. This is the third time that He revealed Himself to the disciples. The Holy Spirit is the one who does his work in our hearts. He reveals to us who Jesus is. We're all on a faith journey. Whether we have saving faith or not, we are all on a continual line where we we have unbelief and we're moving from unbelief to belief in every area of our lives. This is Jesus revealing himself to his disciples. Do you you believe that he will take care of your needs? Do you struggle with trusting who God is? Pray for that. And I, I guarantee you that God will give you an opportunity to learn to trust him. Just don't be mad in the moment. Because it's often not fun. But you get to see God in ways that you could never fathom otherwise. We are all on this journey of unbelief to belief in every aspect of our lives. And Jesus reveals himself to us more and more through the Holy Spirit so that our faith will grow. He does this in many ways, often through difficulties and suffering. But stand firm. Look to Jesus. And remember those times that he has taken care of you. And in that you will know that he is there. This has been a message from the chapel. Thanks for joining us today. For more information about the chapel or any of our campuses, including Akron, Green, Wadsworth, Kenmore, Cuyahoga Falls, and Nordonia, please go to our website at thechapel.life.